Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, we are going to get the program running uh, so we can eat and enjoy and listen to our uh, speakers and our very worthy uh, award recipients. So we're going to get things underway. Uh, this being the Jenkins Medal ceremonies, obviously we are here um, because of one of the truly all-time greats um, and Dan Jenkins. Uh, I was telling somebody before we started, I covered golf for many years at Sports Illustrated. I can't say that I knew Dan Jenkins, but I know that when he was in the golf press room, it was like royalty. And I wish I had gone up to him and engaged him and at least introduced myself, but I was frankly uh, too starstruck. So um, maybe this is the next best thing to be able to be a part of an event like this in his honor um, at a university like this, a communication school like this. It's just, um, it's just great to be here. So to get things rolling um, and introduce uh, the documentary about our namesake, I would like to call up uh, Mike Butter Butterworth, the director for the Center for Sports Communication and Media at the Moody School of Communications at the University of Texas. I'm a, I'm a Longhorn dad. I pay tuition, so I got to get all of it right, right? Otherwise, they're going to surcharge me. Hook him, baby. Mike, come to the mic. Uh, thank you so much, Seth. It's uh, a pleasure to have you here uh, as our uh, MC and, and host for the evening. This is one of our favorite nights of the year, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody here and, and to have the opportunity to say just a few words. Uh, I promise I won't uh, make them uh, lengthy comments, but there are a number of thank yous that I'd like to offer uh, as we start the evening. Uh, and uh, we're, we're so looking forward to being able to celebrate with everybody. Uh, as Seth said, my name is Mike Butterworth. I direct the Center for Sports Communication and Media, which is part of the Moody College of Communication, and we're very excited to serve the mission of the college and the university by using sports as an opportunity to bring people together to talk about the art of storytelling, to fe feature content creation, and to think about the role that sport plays in the social and cultural fabric of the worlds in which we live. And there are few people who are better equipped to being able to do that than sports writers. And so we're delighted to play a role in celebrating the art of sports writing and being able to honor the very best who do that. And uh, we'll get to that very, very soon. Um, it's also just an immense privilege for us to be able to be associated with Dan Jenkins, his legacy, and his family. And so I want to begin by thanking Dan uh, thanking June Jenkins, who has continued to be uh, such a, uh, a force of support for us. Uh, thanking Sally Jenkins, uh, Dan Jr. and Marty, the, the Jenkins family and, and the network of people connected uh, to all that they have meant uh, to Fort Worth, to uh, sports writing, and to us um, is immeasurable. And so uh, let me begin uh, with that. I also want to thank the people who have helped to make this event possible. And so let me begin with the gentleman uh, lurking over uh, to my right, uh, ready to change the files in a moment. That's Christopher Hart and many of you, yes, absolutely. Uh, many of you will have been uh, in contact with Chris because he's the one who makes everything behind the scenes happen in terms of travel and accommodations and making this uh, this dinner possible. And so, Chris, thank you so much for, for everything that, uh, that you have done. And thank you to everybody here at the Headliners Club, uh, McKinnon Morton and her team and all of the folks who are busy right now uh, making sure that we're having a wonderful time uh, at the bar, at these tables, and behind the scenes. Uh, we're so thrilled to have chosen the Headliners Club as the site for this event. Uh, we knew we made a good choice last year, and that has only been reinforced with the experience that we've had last year and this year. So thank you to all of the folks at Headliners. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of you uh, for being here, uh, as well as the people uh, at the Moody College of Communication uh, who make the things that we do possible. And um, uh, along with that, I I'd like to acknowledge one uh, former dean who happens to be here. And uh, Rod Hart, I know you weren't expecting me to do this, but Rod and Peggy Hart are here. Yeah. And it's not merely your kindness and graciousness uh, that I want to acknowledge. I also want to point out the fact that it was uh, Rod's uh, cooperation and vision that helped to initiate some of the sports journalism and sport communication programming 
that we're able to execute in the Moody College of Communication uh, today. And so, Rod, um, thanks for that. And thanks for being here, you and Peggy both. Um, we also want to make sure that we acknowledge the people who have helped to fund uh, the awards themselves, and uh, Andy Priest and Cindy Farmer and Tex Moncrief in particular, both of whom have endowed the medals uh, that we will be presenting tonight. Uh, they're unable to be here with us this evening, but I do want to make sure that we acknowledge them and all of the people who provide support for the award and for the center broadly. We've got a, a few folks uh, who are at our sponsored tables, and I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, those folks as well. The Headliners Foundation, uh, we're in the Headliners Club right now, but the Headliners Foundation and the Vern Lundquist Institute for Sports Media has been a particularly productive partner for us, and uh, they are a silver table sponsor for us tonight, and so I want to thank them. I also want to acknowledge Sports Illustrated for being a bronze table sponsor, along with the uh, co-sponsorship at the bronze level between Brian Perez and John Berger. So thank you uh, to each of, uh, of those sponsors as well as to June Jenkins and the Moody College of Communication School of Journalism and Media and Department of Communication Studies, uh, each of whom have purchased a table as well. Uh, we're grateful for your support. We're grateful that you've allowed so many of our wonderful students to be here. Can I just uh, have anybody who is a Moody College of Communication student uh, give us a little wave for a moment? I like that. That's more than a wave. That's good, though. I like, right? We're good. Uh, I'm sorry that you're all way back there, but I am so, so happy that, uh, that you are here. Uh, um, so much of what we do is about trying to make the student experience unique and special at the University of Texas. What starts here truly does change the world. I've seen it firsthand, and I'm just so proud of all of the work that all of you as students are doing. So thank you for being here. Uh, as you know, our 2023 Jenkins sports legend is George Foreman, and I regret that George's health does not allow him to be here. I do want to communicate that he's at home, he's recovering, he's doing well, um, but on behalf of the family, I uh, want to share the regrets that he cannot be here in person. And for those of you who were specifically here to, uh, to hear about George Foreman, I assure you that we will still incorporate that into the program, and we'll look forward to hearing from Cedric Golden uh, about that a, a little bit later on. Meanwhile, we are here to celebrate the legacy of Dan Jenkins, to celebrate the art of sports writing, and that means we are here to celebrate the winners of the 2023 Dan Jenkins Medal for Excellence in Sports Writing. And so I specifically want to say congratulations and express my admiration to Bill Roden, to Tom Juno, and Paula Levine, this year's winners who could not be more deserving, who have inspired so many people through their attention to the social, the cultural, the political impact of sports, and have forced us to reckon with the realities of what happen in sports, um, sometimes uh, when we don't want them to. And uh, their writing is an eloquent statement about the power of sports and about the power of what sports journalism and storytelling can mean. So thank you all for your work, and we're just so thrilled to be able to celebrate with you tonight. So to get things started, we will be presenting the medals soon, and uh, uh, Seth will be introducing uh, each step along the way. But to get things started, we want to begin with a tribute to Dan. And so when this event began in 2017, uh, we were uh, in the position to, to commission a short documentary film uh, celebrating uh, Dan's life and legacy as a writer. And uh, this film called By Dan Jenkins is the way that we will begin our programming tonight. It'll take us just a moment of transition here on the old laptop. But uh, once uh, that happens, we'll get started. Uh, and obviously, we invite you to enjoy your dinner while we enjoy the film. And then we'll be hearing from Seth very soon. Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great night. Thank you for showing that. And I hope that the students learned something about Dan Jenkins. It was great for me to see um, at once. Um, for me, an aspiring, used to be young sports writer, very inspiring, and also makes me feel completely inadequate. And I feel that same way. Uh, bringing up our next speaker, who will introduce um, our Jenkins Medal Awards winners, one of the true giants in the profession, just an unbelievable uh, reporter, 
storyteller, writes with great passion, and of course, a former Jenkins Award winner in 2017, here to introduce his ESPN colleagues. Please welcome the great Wright Thompson. Well, thank you very, very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to get to present this award to my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Tom and Paula, on what really is one of the great nights of the year because, I mean, they call it, what's the name of it? The sports writer, what's the name of this thing? <laughs> Excellence in sports writing. I've always thought that it really was, though, a celebration of the tribe of people who love these kinds of stories. And, you know, I remember being here with Roy Blunt who was the speaker at the table. I really thought Roy was too drunk to be in public. And we were kind of looking at each other like, this is going to be a, like, what's he going to do? And then he, and then he walks up and he just kills. And I was like, okay, that's why we have a, you know, young Skywalker. We have a lot to learn. Uh, uh, you know, I know for certain when I first felt like I might have a place in this tribe and it was at a major championship at the open championships in, in St. Andrews and, you know, my coworker and best friend in the world, Seth Wickersham, who's here, who's written, you know, so many just monster stories. Uh, he and I just devoured everything that Dan Jenkins wrote, that Frank DeFord wrote, that Gary Smith wrote, and, you know, wanted to write stories like that, like the one that Paula and Tom are being uh, uh, celebrated for tonight. And Dan Jenkins, with a cigarette, uh, walked past me in the press room and just, casually said my name and I, I went outside, never mind the time difference. And like, I think woke Seth up. It was like, excuse my French, but it was like, Dan Jenkins is my fucking name. You know, it was like that. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I've always felt like when we gather here, we celebrate the fact that he wasn't a guy doing a job. He was a guy, uh, who was part of a tribe who was performing a craft who wrote up until the very, very end. He wasn't, writing because they, he got a paycheck every other Thursday. He was writing because this was the thing he did. This was who he was. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about both Paula and Tom, who you'll get to hear from in a second, is that that is absolutely true. Uh, Paula got up this morning and drove to Waco to be in a courtroom. If Paula is ever doing a story about you and your phone rings... You need to just tell her every bad thing you've ever done so that maybe she's not mad at you when she sits down to type. But she is relentless. Uh, I'm embarrassed to be talking about journalism in front of her. I'm trying not to make eye contact because this is absurd. Uh, she is a force of nature and a stone cold killer and, uh, and also is helpful to everyone and you know if when idiots have to call up and ask her something super simple like how do I find an unlisted phone number you know she can find the flight logs for the space shuttle but like <laughs> but like she'll help you and uh and I feel like that the story that they won for it it's a fabulous story but it's not it's not like they're one hit wonders. I mean, this is not outside the, you know, this is just what she does on the regular. And Tom, who I don't know if any of you know, but Tom is absolutely the greatest living magazine writer, full stop. And uh, has been doing this at an incredibly high and inspiring level for a very, very long time. And, you know, for those of us who've, you know, who've been running around writing these stories for a really long time and, you know, sometimes you just get exhausted. And the person I always look to is like my model for like what I, you know, how I imagine a writing life and a reading life and a curious life is Tom. And like Dan, he's not getting a paycheck. Like Paula, he's not getting a paycheck. This is just a way of moving through the world and the stories are an almost accidental byproduct of it. So the story that they're winning for tonight is absolutely special, but this award for them, this celebration of this tribe of people that we're all members of, uh, it's not like it's a one-off story finding contest. This is, this is, they do this regularly. And uh, so this is a fabulous celebration of, of both of them and the work that they have done for a long time and will continue to do. And it, it's my honor to present them with this incredibly prestigious award.
always wanted to do this. Yeah, here we go. There your, you go. Your intro is amazing. Are we gonna? We, I'm gonna sing the national anthem for, <laughs> for long. I'm gonna sing the national anthem for Long Island, which is. So, by the way, if I wanted a drunken idiot to ruin a Billy Joel song, I would go see Billy Joel. All right. Damn. You're up, man. Okay. All right. All right. Come here. All right. Thanks. Wow. So. A medal turns out to be so much cooler than a trophy. Heavy. Um, so the, the story that um, Paul and I collaborated on, it's called Untold. And it really was untold. It was untold for 40 some odd years. And um, I'd been wanting to, I knew about it when it happened and I wanted to write about it when it happened, but I had I was a kid when it happened, and so I had no ability to write about it. And then um, in, the, in 2020, uh, Todd Hodney, who was the, um, the perpetrator of the crimes that we covered in the story, died in prison, and I decided that it was time. And But how am I going to write a story about something that happened 40-some-odd years ago? I've been wanting to write the story for 40-plus years, and, um, but I was like, okay. I write, I write for ESPN, and they, um, they sub wound up supporting a story that took us two years and 32,000 words to finish. And um, I just wanted to thank ESPN for their support, for to Chris Buckle, who runs our operation and gives us all the support. and juice that we need to get to get it done and um, to Eric Neal who was our, our editor we, one of the things that enabled us to to do the story was we just had a remarkable team of people um, it was Eric Neal it was Laura Pertel who's not here and it was the great Paul Levine um, Paul is going to tell you about some of the things that enabled this story to happen, which was the amazing testimony of the women who were victimized by this guy, Todd Hodney. Um, these were women who had not, also not told their story for 40 years and were, I mean, they were so brave. They were so resolute. They were so resilient. And they told this thing, this horrible thing that had happened to them. 40 years ago. But I can tell you right now that this story would not have been written without the contributions and the amazing ninja skills of the amazing Paula Levine. So. Oh my yeah. gosh. Uh, ninja skills, I like that. Uh, I'm like a stone code killer and like ninja skills. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the bar is so high. I, I wanted to echo Tom's statements with, with how grateful I am to Chris Buckle and to Eric Neal and to Laura Bertel who took us through this whole process and supported us every step of the way. And of course to like, and Tom and your amazing ability to see this as a story, see this as a narrative and, the, what I've learned from working with you and with Eric, and it's just, it's been incredible. I mean, I feel like I've grown so much as a journalist going through this. It's been, it's a wonderful experience. Um, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm glad, Michael, that you mentioned earlier about how this is, this is a hard story to tell. And it's one that a lot of people don't want to read because I often joke when, when people ask me what I do and I tell them I work for ESPN, they say, what do you do for ESPN? And my first response is, well, I ruin sports for people. <laughs> and, and it's a little flip, but uh, you know, I, a lot of times, as you know, especially with college sports, people do not want to hear the bad things that have happened with their programs. And, and that is a reality. And, and I think it's, it's probably a little Pollyanna, but I but I like to think that if you love sports, you want them done right. And so whatever reporting we can do, whatever level of accountability we can bring to a program, to a pattern, to a way of thinking, then let then let's do it. And let's get all the stuff out there and let's let's have a reckoning. 
And I think that this piece, as much as it is a testimony to the individual survivors from Penn State, from Long Island, that it is speaks to a larger pattern. And I am just incredibly grateful that it's been recognized and that people value this work that we do because it is not easy and it is sometimes very ugly, but it needs to be out there so that it doesn't keep happening. So thank you for that. Thank you for recognizing that. Excellent. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I gotta say one last thing. I gotta say, it, sports is nothing without like, you know, burning rivalries. And even if you don't have the street cred to still represent them, I do want to say it's very notable. And thank you, Seth, for mentioning Johnny Carson, that you started off this amazing tribute to Jan Jen Dan Jenkins with the most famous graduate from the University of Nebraska College of Journalism and Mass Communications, Johnny Carson. So, to my alma mater, go Big Red. <laughs> So uh, I met Eric, the editor, earlier today. Is there a Chris Buckle in the room that you were referencing, Chris? So I just, as, as someone who does this for a living, uh, not the easiest time in the sports media, not the most stable, but what's nothing is stable, right? But please pass along to the folks in Bristol and New York, whoever's making the decisions, the Disney folks, thank you for supporting people like Paula and Tom and everybody who works there because I keep hearing that there's, you know, there's no margin in, in, in this type of work. And what she said is absolutely true. These stories need to be told and some things need to be ruined, but we can't do our job unless you empower us, you empower her, you empower them. So please pass that along to ask them to keep investing, keep spending money, particularly on salaries, which is the most important investment. <laughs> But let, let us not lose sight of that. Let us not lose sight of that. Um, so uh, un unfortunately, um, unfortunately, George Foreman could make it. Um, I was very <laughs> looking forward to being with him here tonight. Hope he's doing OK. But, uh, you know, uh, Sed Golden is a, a local uh, columnist here in Austin, sports columnist. Uh, he's a teacher. I had the incredible honor of um, visiting his class. Um, Last year around this time, I was actually in Austin. I had to do it over Zoom because there was an ice storm in Austin, which I found curious because there was neither ice nor a storm, but it was enough to close the campus down for a couple of days. Um, but I, we, I was just saying, you know, I, I, um, I visited his class, and this is the truth, my guy, because I've spoken to a, a lot of classes. It was the best set of questions that I've ever gotten. And so, um, you know, people like said Golden who are giving of their time, giving of their knowledge, their experience, the wisdom to pass along to this next generation of journalists um, is, is critical. So we don't have Big George, but Professor Golden is in the house and he's gonna come up and talk about the champ. Come on up here, said. I know a lot of y'all are going, hey, George did make it. No, it's not George, it's not George. I mean, you're one big fat black guy in the room's enough. That's enough, that's enough. So I'll have to do for tonight. So um, for you youngsters out there that don't know George Form Foreman, go to YouTube. Just go to YouTube and watch him beat up people. It was something to see. I, I'm uh, not the oldest person in here, but I'm in the 99 percentile. And I grew up in the 70s. And in the 70s, it was football and boxing in my household. And Ali, Foreman, Frazier, Norton, Holmes, uh, a couple of white guys mixed in, Quarry. They, they passed them around. Yeah, not a good decade for the white guys in the 70s. But um, so, so Big George uh, won the gold medal in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And a lot of you know Tommy Smith and John Carlos held up the fist in protest uh, of things that were going on in our country and George paraded around the ring with the American flag and took some guff for that. He took some guff but no one said it to his face. So, so of course, who would? Because uh, George Foreman was a bad man. But in the 70s, he beat up Joe Frazier and won the heavyweight championship and 
when he was getting ready to fight Muhammad Ali, uh, people were saying, George, just don't kill Muhammad. We love Muhammad. And Ali beat him. And then he lost a couple of more fights, and it plunged him into a 10-year depression. The one thing about America, America loves a good comeback story. And George came back, and he recreated himself time and time again. He came back in 87 and barked on, a, on an epic quest to regain the heavyweight championship. So one night in 19... 87, I think it was February, I was working in a steakhouse in Tyler, Texas, working my way through college, six-year plan, didn't become a doctor, but I, I was pacing myself. And so one night, it was like 9, nine o'clock, it was like 8.50, and when you're a waiter, you don't want anyone coming in late. The cooks are going to be mad at you, and you know you can't get the boss to lock the door early, so... I look up, and this big, bald guy walks in with this little man in a beanie, a little beanie. I didn't recognize him uh, because he was clean-shaven, and no one had seen George Foreman in a while. He had, he had joined the ministry and started a church, and he always said if he was going to come back to boxing, it would be to fund his church. And so he sat down, and I had no idea who he was. He goes, I'm going to get a salad and... Uh, bring me two lobster tails and two glasses of orange juice. And I said, okay. Yeah, yeah. and so I did. And so he and the other man were talking, and um, he kept calling him Archie. And I find out later it was Archie Moore, which, um, you know, and I told my dad, I go, I met George Foreman. He goes, who is he with? I go, some old guy named Archie Moore. My dad goes, you're an idiot. That's, that's the guy you should be talking about, Archie Moore. That's the mongoose. You don't know the mongoose? I go, I had no idea what a mongoose was. So I... I didn't know, so, and so I heard him talking, and I and, I, and it kind of occurred to me. I go, "Are you George Foreman?" And he goes, "Yes, I am." And he, I go, "Well, what are you doing in Tyler?" And he goes, "Well, I'm from Marshall, and I'm getting ready to fight again." And he goes, "We're going after Tyson." And I go, "Mike Tyson?" <laughs> you know, George is 38 at the time, and Mike Tyson's 22, and he's the heavyweight champ, and. And, uh, you know, you got guys my age, you know, Tyson and I are the same age, and we were in awe of him. He was going around beating up grown men at 22, and I saw this big pudgy guy who was, he was formidable, but he was old. 38 back then was old. Bill, I, we miss 38, don't we? But that was old. And so, and so I go, well, good luck to you, Mr. Foreman. And we took a photo, and my wife has it if y'all want to see it. Uh, of course, nowadays they go, who's the who's the kid with with Cedric? They think George is me, but no, it's not. It's not. So he comes back and he fights like eleven fights, and he wins the championship at age forty five, and no one had ever done that recreation, recreating himself. He goes on to become an entrepreneur. Everyone in here has a foreman grill, and and George got a piece of that. And he sold, he sold that company for $140 million. At one point, he was making $5 million bucks a month. That's a lot of grills. That is a lot of grills. And so HBO Boxing was, was a mainstay in my household, and I, I cried when they got rid of boxing. And if you watch HBO Boxing, you know Jim Lampley's a crier. I was crying right along with Jim when they got rid of boxing because I missed George. Uh, his commentary on the fight game was unlike any other. And the one thing that, that I'll leave you with that I loved about George Foreman, and I still do, and prayers up to him in his recovery, is he never lost sight of who he is. He never lost his spiritual base. At, at his core, he was a good guy who just used to kick the crap out of people and got paid to do it. And, and you know, who wouldn't like to beat someone up and get money? I mean, I love that. I, I love the idea of doing something like that. I've had bosses that I'd like to, yeah. So... Um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, George Foreman is a true testament to the American spirit, a true success story, a comeback king. And they say nice guys finish last, not George Foreman. He's one of the good guys, and he always finished first. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Seth. That was awesome. That was awesome. So, you know, when I, um, 
I got to Sports Illustrated in um, 1995. It was um, the end of uh, something called the, the, the Bake Off, where there were two candidates for managing editor, Bill Colson and Dan Okrent. Dan Okrent, trivia time, is the uh, considered the father of uh, fantasy sports. We're going to have to explain to the young folks in the room what rotisserie baseball was. That's where it all started. Rotisserie. See, the, 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 uh, the older... The older crowd understands. But so I had just gotten there and I got into this great institution and I had heard there were some chatters around the building that there was a book, a full scale book being written about Sports Illustrated. And, you know, growing up, um, you know, it's all I ever really wanted to do was to write for Sports Illustrated. I couldn't believe I was actually there and I couldn't believe that there was actually a book um, coming out. And one of the reasons why um, I want to write for Sports Illustrated um, is because going beyond who won, who lost, what the score was, how many points, the standings, all of that, there were deeper stories to tell that tr- translated outside the world of sports, and that was best exemplified um, in the sports page, uh, the column page, specifically the sports page in the New York Times with Bill Roden and Dave Anderson. So um, I don't know that I've ever met Michael McCambridge, but what I know is that he wrote his book, The Franchise, about Sports Illustrated, uh, and I am not in it because I was completely inconsequential to the magazine at the time he was writing the, sport, the, the book. So if there's ever a sequel and I can get in the index just for like you know a quick mention, that would be awesome. But uh, I'm really glad that Mr. Roden is here to be recognized tonight with this great award, and I can't think of anyone better to uh, introduce him than uh, Mike McCambridge. So, Mike, step to the mic. Good evening. On September 28, 1968, Eddie Robinson's Grambling Tigers played a football game against Earl Banks's Morgan State Bears. The game was not played in rural Louisiana, where Grambling is, and it wasn't played in Baltimore, where Morgan State is located. Instead, it was played in New York City in front of a sellout crowd of 64,000 at the most famous stadium in American sports. Yankee Stadium. It was a coming out party for black college football and also a wake up call for white America, proof that historically black colleges and universities had something more than just this deep reservoir of football talent, but also had a national following and were becoming big time. The game itself was a classic, won by Morgan State nine to seven with a late goal line stand and playing on the field that day were no less than 31 student athletes who would go on to play pro football. And also one student athlete, Bill Roden, who would go on to make a name in journalism. That game in 68 occurred at a pivotal time in American sports history. The HBCUs had flourished in the face of racism in the Jim Crow South And in the aftermath of this game, Grambling and the other HBCU powers would enjoy a new prominence. Some of you my age might remember Sunday mornings watching the Grambling replays right along with Notre Dame replays before the NFL game started. But things were also beginning to change. Soon, major colleges in the South, like Texas, Alabama, and LSU, would begin recruiting elite African-American student-athletes and cutting into the pipeline that was enjoyed by the HBCUs. This was undeniably a sign of more prevalent integration and social progress, as well as a belated righting of wrongs. Eventually, Ole Miss would even take the plantation owner off their helmets and stop playing Dixie at the football games. These broad social changes were also happening in journalism. And Bill Roden, after graduating from Morgan State, went to work for the Baltimore Afro-American, where his mentor was the legendary writer Sam Lacey, one of a cohort of heroic black journalists who had fought for integration in the 30s and 40s on the fields of play, 
even as they themselves were encountering segregation that kept them out of press boxes and locker rooms throughout that period. Men like Hallie Harding of the Los Angeles Tribune, who made a stirring speech in front of the Los Angeles Coliseum Commission in 1946 that led to the reintegration of pro football. Meanwhile, Sam Lacey, then at the Chicago Defender, and Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier worked tirelessly advocating for the integration of Major League Baseball, a dream finally realized with the arrival of Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby, which they went on to chronicle. Roden would eventually get opportunities that his predecessors never had. So after writing for Ebony, he went to the Baltimore Sun and then was hired by the New York Times, where he would become the first black sports columnist at the country's most influential newspaper. That was a label he quickly transcended. And on that powerhouse staff with heavyweights like George Vesey and Pulitzer Prize winner Dave Anderson, Roden got people's attention, often writing the most challenging, most thought-provoking columns on the issues of the day. By the time you reached the end of a Roden story, you often faced a fresh perspective on this long familiar element of sports. You were frequently convinced, but invariably forced to reconsider some of your assumptions. In 2006, he published the critically acclaimed book, $40 Million Slaves, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Black Athlete, which further proved the power of his pen. Even his titles could piss people off. I had the pleasure with working with Bill later on his epic oral history, Third and a Mile, The Trials and Triumphs of the Black Quarterback. And I can remember so well my excitement as that project was taking shape about the way he was weaving together these disparate threads of this largely untold story in a fresh and compelling way, bringing back these long overlooked trailblazers, Chuck Ely, Condridge Holloway, J.C. Watts, Turner Gill. Not all of them were destined for pro stardom, but each of those stories spoke to a larger, more complicated drama filled with, just as his subtitle attested, both trials and triumphs. You know, uh, Bruce Springsteen has said that his songwriting, in sum, measures the distance between the American dream and the American reality. And I think Roden has made a career of surveying a similar divide. This distance between the comfortable myths that sports fans like to tell themselves about how level the playing field is and how colorblind sports is and how meritocratic sports is and the often less idealized, less optimistic reality. So the other thing I wanna mention Roden didn't just write about racism and the racial divide, he also did something about it. For decades, he's hosted gatherings for up and coming writers, the legendary black folks dinners at the Final Four and the Super Bowl, where the next, <laughs> where the next generation of African American journalists would learn the ropes. ESPN's Mark Spears told me, he's the uncle that I never had in this business. I call him Mr. Roden because he deserves that. The Washington Post Jerry Brewer said, I learned more in those final four dinners about how the sausage is made and about camaraderie and about the business than any other experience in my career. When Bill left the Times in 2016 for ESPN's The Undefeated, he started the Roden's Fellows Program, which offered internships to aspiring journalists from HBCUs. He paid it forward. He continues today at Anscape, the artist formerly known as The Undefeated, where he's helped carve a vibrant, important niche in both sports and culture. So, it is a long way from Morgan State Grambling in 1968 to the honor he's receiving tonight, but in a real sense, Roden's journey is intrinsically connected to the American journey that we've been on. And thoughtful sports fans everywhere are better for having him as one of our guides on this epic trip. 
So it gives me great pleasure to present the 2023 Dan Jenkins Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Sports Writing to Mr. Roden, William C. Roden. Sir. Black folks' dinner is all out now. <laughs> ain't black anymore. Uh, first of all, um, uh, let me get a couple things out of the way. You know, in Harlem, I go to the Apollo all the time. There's the uh, Apollo Theater where they've got these, you know, the talent shows and all that. And they've got the Sandman, whose job is when you go too long to come and with a hook and hook your ass off the stage. So I said tonight, I don't want the Sandman to come out. And, and But I want to get two things out the way. First is um, uh, for the students in the back. Um, this is very humbling. There are a lot of great people, great people in this industry. You just heard from one of them, Mike McCambridge. I mean, <laughs> it's phenomenal. Uh, you know, um, you just heard from two of my colleagues, uh, 33,000 words two years, and we're talking about this, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. They're phenomenal. If you look at the past winners of this, I mean, this is a very humbling business. You know, I'm not sure what you think you want to do in life, but this is a very humbling, humbling business. No matter what you think you've got, somebody's got more. No matter how good you think you are, somebody's better. You've written two books, somebody's written 20. You know, you won, I, I used to, at, at the times I would go up to our Pulitzer floor and I may have written a really good column that day. And by the time I finished going through the, the Pulitzer floor, I, I, I was asking myself, why am I even in this business? You know, people have won two or three Pulitzers. So at some point you just have to say the hell with it and just be the best you can be because it really doesn't matter. That's all you can do. So having got that out the way, uh, I'll get to the formal part of this. I, yeah. um, the first thing I would really like to do is thank everybody who, uh, the jury, who um, presented me with this honor. It's, it's, it's humbling, um, and, and it's really beyond humbling. Uh, you just saw, talking about, saw this whole thing of Dan Jenkins. And I'm reading, I'm looking at this. I'm like, say, why am I, I mean, really, <laughs> you know, you just, what am I doing there. You look at the life that he's lived. Uh, and it's, it's awesome. It's an awesome business. So thank you very much. Uh, when, um, so when Mike called me, or not, they called me, sent me the, the, the message saying that I was a recipient. Uh, I was really shocked. I wrote him back immediately. I was really shocked and awe. And I really was. I was really shocked and awe. And I was in a state of shock for two reasons. A, a couple of days before, my daughter had just told me to sit down and told me, Dad, I'm, I told me I was going to have my first grandchild. And, <laughs> you know, and you talk about shock. So I was shocked from that because I was still just getting used to being married, you know. Um, but so that was a shock. Uh, and then this award, uh, receiving this award was also humbling and shock. When you look at all the people who you guys have honored before. It was really, truly, truly a humbling. And I was asking myself uh, the other day, uh, I've been on the Deion Sanders trail. You know, Deion is a gift that keeps giving. You know? <laughs> and so I've been following for the last six weeks, you know, and down in when he's at TCU, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I was at, uh, uh, in, uh, where's Arizona State? In Tempe, you know, and I'm like walking to, for some reason, you know, I've, I've been on earth a little more than 70 years now. Uh, and that's as close as I'll come to it. Kind of basically, I've been in denial. I thought well, I was like 40 and, uh, you know. So, but I was, I had to go down. I needed just one quote. I needed a quote for this column I was writing. And I said, I needed the president of ASU. And of course I saw 
out the press box. I saw he's way over at the, at the, in the end zone. And you know, the, the, you've got like, I don't know, 40 flights of steps that you have to walk down to do that. So I walked down and I said, what the heck am I doing this for? You know, why am I doing this? And I just heard what Dan was saying about, well, what else are you gonna do? That's what we do, right? That's kind of what we do. You know, he plays golf. I don't play golf. Uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I listen to jazz. I host jazz listening sets. But outside of that, this is kind of what I do. You know, I write columns. I've written, I wrote the Sports of the Columns. I was at the Times for 34 years. I wrote the Sports of the Times column for 27, uh, what used to be called the Times Sports Department. <laughs> That's another conversation for another day. <laughs> But <laughs> we won't, you know. Um, but it's kind of what we what we do. It's kind of our life, you know. Right is right. Um, so um, receiving an award that's named after an iconic and legendary uh, journalist and author is just awesome. It's probably one of the most awesome uh, awards in this ongoing career. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do, I wanted to, um, uh, again, I, I said I, for the second time, I wanted to thank everybody responsible for giving me the honor from the bottom of my heart and all that. But I, I did want to acknowledge um, a couple people. I wanted to acknowledge uh, Kathleen McElroy. Um, um, you know, um, Kathleen and I, um, were colleagues for a number of times, uh, for a number of years at, at the New York Times. Um, she edited a lot of my columns. We're still friends, yeah, <laughs> despite that. She was a great, a great editor. Um, but what she's done and represented in terms of her fighting for inclusion and diversity and being on the right side of history uh, is, is, is something that I admire um, I was always proud to call you a colleague, but now I'm really proud to call you a hero in my life for what you represent. So thank you just for who you are and how you stood tall in fighting for diversity and inclusion. And I was thinking about that a um, couple of reasons. I'm about to go off script for just a minute. But when we talk about diversity and inclusion, so I told you I've been on the Deion Sanders uh, trail. The disturbing part about that is what's in the press box. There have been a number of times, many times, in 2023, that I'm the only or maybe one or two black people in the press box in 2023. F press box of two, you know, 200 people. And I'm looking around, and I'm like one of maybe three black people in the press box. And I wish I didn't, there, there are times, I remember uh, you mentioned my, my mentor, Sam Lacey. And, uh, you know, Sam's whole thing, you know, for those of you who don't know, particularly students, if you don't know Sam Lacey, Google him. Sam played a pivotal role in desegregating Major League Baseball. That was his whole life. And that's where I got my spirit from. It's basic, that's the only way I knew to do my job was basically be a crusader. Um, I remember the great John Stedman, um, who was a News American. I remember I ran into him. He and Sam were on the trail a lot. Uh, and, and Stedman, I remember I saw him at a Super Bowl. And Stedman said, you know, Bill, you know, Sam and I worked, but Sam never seemed to be happy. He said, he never seemed to be happy. And I thought about that. And I thought about all the stuff that Sam had to go through, covering games. They wouldn't let him in the press box. He had to stand, you know, some, cover some games from the top of the press box or some games in the dugout. And his whole thing was breaking down barriers, breaking down barriers. And I thought about that. I said, well, what the hell is it for him to be happy about? You know, and I inherited a lot of that. Yeah, I wish that I could, you know, go to the press box and, you know, have tell jokes and go drink beer and all that, but the stuff you just see is almost it's a it's a blessing and it's a curse, you know, to to not be able to to 
I guess you see the joy, but you kept looking at the potential of things and how far we have to go. Um, so again, that was unsolicited, but I remember when Stedman told me that, and it took me a minute to register. I said, yeah, I know why. I, I, yeah, I wish, I, I wish you, you could just enjoy this stuff and have the luxury to enjoy it. But there's just too many things and too many miles yet to go. So I guess to the extent that this is a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, I guess that's kind of my life, the writing columns and just, you know, uh, passing the torch. Uh, I want to say one thing about Sally Jenkins, uh, but before I say that, um, I guess the purpose of all of our, at a certain point in your life, as students, you're trying to climb Jacob's Ladder and get there. But at a certain point of life, and Jackie Robinson said, it, it's only about two things. It's about handing back, giving back, and paving the way. That's really all it's about, helping young people, uh, not just passing the torch, but making them take the torch. You know, I tell, you know, I'm not just going to give you the torch. you got to take the torch. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the Roden Fellows. Uh, the Roden Fellows is something that um, uh, was created. Basically, I went to an HBCU, and every year we select six young people from HBCUs to basically get a full fellowship and provide content and with the idea of putting them in the pipeline because we desperately need it. Um, and we've also formed a partnership. I teach a course at the Cronkite School. Can I say that? Cronkite School? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. But I, I teach a course there. Huh? He's from yeah, so, Cronkite. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, at some point it all comes together, right? You know, um, but the idea, uh, uh, we, we've, I think what a lot of graduate schools realize is that we have got to get more diverse. We've got to be more diverse. So we've developed a, a little bit of a partnership with Cronkite. Every year they'll take a couple of fellows and they'll give them essentially like a, a free ride to go to graduate school, to Cronkite school, because we have to diversify. Um, so uh, the, the only thing, that, talking about uh, legacy, if Sally were here, and I've told her this all the time, I, I love Sally Jenkins. I, I, uh, I don't read a lot of other people's stuff. I know you're supposed to. But in terms, you, know, you are, you're supposed to. But there are only, you know, a couple of people I really care what they think. And Sally is one of them. Whenever there's something, I do care about what Sally Jenkins thinks. I do care about her perspective. And every time I see her in a press box, it's always reassuring uh, to know that uh, we're about, I'm about 10 years older than her, but know that we're still on the same trail. We're still doing the work. And uh, above and beyond my respect for Sally's uh, uh, work as a journalist, I love how she's keeping her dad's legacy alive. I love that about her. Uh, it's a lot of work, uh, whether you're Jeannie Matusme Ash keeping Arthur's legacy alive, or Rachel Robinson keeping uh, Jackie's legacy alive, keeping an iconic figure like Dan Jenkins working with you guys to keep his legacy alive is uh, tremendous. And I just feel so honored tonight uh, to be part of that tradition and that legacy. So again, thank you so, so, so very much for this honor. Um, thanks everybody for indulging me. Uh, but this is just wonderful. So I thank you. Thank you all. That's it. Congratulations to all our winners. Thank you for the great work that you do. Thank you, Professor Butterworth, for putting this together. I'm sure it's a lot of work. I'll only leave with one thought from that Dan Jenkins documentary early on. He had a college football cover at Sports Illustrated. The banner said, Texas is number one. So I think maybe it'd be nice if we saw that banner on the cover of Sports Illustrated in uh, about seven or eight weeks, right? Hook him, baby. Have a great night. <laughs>